The Sea View Hotel by Maria Kyle. The Sea View Hotel was on the side street off the promenade. A view of the sea obtainable only by craning out of the third floor window. But Abigail wasn't there for sightseeing, and neither was Mr. Smythe. So she supposed it didn't matter. She signed the register with slow care, trying to write neatly and remember the correct smell spelling. No earthly point in doing anything halfway. That was what Elsie had said. It was Elsie who'd got her into this. Easy money, she'd said. Five pounds for half a day. That was more than they got in a week at Lion's Corner House, including the tips. Abigail felt like boxing her ears now. Her stomach trembled and she felt thirsty and sick under the clerk's oily gaze. She was reminded of why she agreed to it when the bellboy stopped outside room 203 and crooked an expectant eyebrow. She smiled badly and pantomimed rummaging in her handbag. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, she said, blushing. He shrugged. At least you ain't got no luggage, he said significantly and sauntered away. She pinched her cheeks, straightened her seams and knocked, the noise loud and dead in the dingy carpeted corridor. The door jerked open in a gush of pale afternoon light, blocked by the dark silhouette of a man. Hello, he said. Hello, she replied. His dark hair was slicked back with brill cream. It was melting already, and a lock had fallen over his pale forehead. He was smoking a cigarette and wore a navy blue double-breasted suit with wide shoulders and a chalk stripe. She hadn't really known what she had expected until she saw him in the watery light of the warm hotel room, and he wasn't it. She thought he might look beastly, somehow, or caddish, like the spivs who sometimes came into the cafe in the afternoon when everyone else was working, who chewed on toothpicks and were overly familiar and always undertipped. But he didn't look like that at all. The room was pink, the faded upholstery, the colour of face powder, the counterpane, the slippery salmon colour, the carpet blown rose, trodden and dark. Mr. Smythe gestured her towards the window, as far from the double bed in the corner as possible. She was determined to ignore the bed's existence, as she might a rude or flirtatious remark to which she had no answer. There were two high back chairs and a low tea table with an ashtray on it, which looked crystal but was likely glass. The large, heavy sort people bludgeoned one another with in green paperbacks. Beyond the table, was a dirty sash window looking out onto a wall with a faded advertisement for Brasso. Beyond that hung a sky full of rain. The rain whispered drearily against the glass and she felt a draft from somewhere and heard a faint rattle and for a second it was so horribly real and squalid that she wanted to scream or even cry. But that wouldn't do anyone any good. She was here to do a job, and Mr. Smythe didn't need a silly girl bursting into tears on him. That was exactly the sort of thing Elsie had warned against. Strictly professional and strictly small talk, she'd said. It was easy work, though fearfully dull. Elsie had been doing it for a year or two now, on and off. Think of it as a day out, Elsie had told her. You don't have to be nice to them, just civil. It's all they expect, and in most cases, more than they deserve. Then she kissed Abigail on the cheek, leaving a hard red mark, and fluttered her fingers in goodbye. Oh, thanks awfully for doing this, darling. You're a brick. Mr. Smythe followed Abigail to the table and waited for her to sit first. She sat. She smiled. He smiled. His teeth were even and very white. He stabbed his cigarette out in the bludgeon ashtray, which already contained three crumpled butts. You're Edith, I suppose, he said. There was something about his accent. It sounded exotic, mid-Atlantic, like a film star's, but it wasn't quite. He didn't offer his name. Abigail swallowed. Agnes, uh, Edith couldn't come. Always keep the same initial, Elsie had said. It was easier to remember. 
Your name doesn't need to be real any more than his does. She must have looked anxious because it's okay, he said, in that queer accent of his, like someone pretending to be American. Nobody's going to disturb us. Nothing to worry about. It sounded like he said, a boat. You're Canadian, she said suddenly, forgetting herself. Her aunt's husband was Canadian. He'd been a pilot in the Great War. Mr. Smythe smiled cautiously. No flies on you, I guess, Agnes, he said. Care for a drink? She very much cared for a drink, but didn't know if it would be appropriate to accept. She looked around for clues. A half-drained whiskey tumbler, real crystal this time, sat on the sideboard alongside a chrome ice bucket and tongs. Well, I'm having one, he said encouragingly, and crossed to the sideboard, picking up and draining his drink. Or rather, another. We've a couple of hours to get through after all, and there isn't much else to do. Join me? The way he said it, she knew he wanted it more than most men wanted a kiss or a win on the horses. She could hold her liquor as long as it was only a little. Where was the harm? All right, she said, and he smiled again. Wider now, all teeth and crinkled eyes. When he wasn't smiling, you could see the ghost of crow's feet in the sunburn. Though his build was wiry rather than muscular, he looked healthy and outdoorish somehow. Like he ought to be striding out along the seafront or riding a horse. Not cooped up in a dingy pink room with a perfect stranger. He looked as if he'd never been in a hotel like the room like this in his life. And she was fairly sure he hadn't. On the rocks, he asked, holding a cube over her glass. She nodded. It splashed. He handed her the tumbler and clanked it with his own. What shall we drink to? He asked her, sitting down. She shook her head. She didn't want to suggest the king. I mean, it seemed rather disrespectful under the circumstances. He crinkled his eyes again and laughed silently. <laughs> Here's to divorce, he said. He drank half and set his glass down. She sipped hers, still too strong. The, mate, the melting ice made oily swirls in the brass-coloured liquid. She put it down and looked out of the window. Done this before? He asked her. His voice was quieter now, as if the whiskey had damped it. She shook her head. <sighs> Me either, he said. He reached into his breast pocket. Now, she thought of the money, though hadn't Elsie said that they paid at the end? Then suddenly, absurdly, she thought of gangsters and revolvers, but he only brought out a silver cigarette case and flipped it open, offering her the lonely cigarette inside. Oh, I can't take your last, she said. I must have some somewhere. Elsie had given her half a packet yesterday when she had spent her last shilling. She'd gone hungry this morning, lacking even a few pence for a cup of tea and a bun. She'd rather have a sandwich than whiskey and cigarettes, but it seemed rude to impose. He was spending enough on her already as it was. Take one, he urged, shaking the diamond pattern case at her. So she did. And she leaned in for a light. She noticed a web of silver scars on his knuckles and a worn inscription on the lighter. To Peter, with love, from... The name, it was obscured. Outside, the rain was now pelting down as if it had strong opinions of the sea and the town and all the people in it. She angled her wrist subtly, glancing at her watch. <sighs> Ten minutes. More than a hundred to go. Oh, hey, he said. I nearly forgot. And darted back to the sideboard, on which she now saw a black leather wallet. She looked away quickly, but he'd already grabbed it and was carefully unfolding a large white five pound note. Just so you know that I'm good for it, he said, waving it like a flag. She didn't want to touch it. It made everything seem too real. She got up, clutching her hardly touched glass. Is there any soda? Sure, help yourself, he said. 
She found the siphon and topped up her tumbler, almost to the brim. She took a gulp with her back to him and felt better, then turned to face him again. He was staring at the end of his cigarette, watching it burn between his fingers without smoking it. He had a nice face. It was lean and even, his eyes slate blue in the afternoon light. He was about 30, she supposed. Clean shaven, brown haired, though he could very well be dark, uh, blonde without the brill cream. He didn't look like a Peter. All the Peters she had known had been buff, hearty chaps with donkey voices like man-sized schoolboys. She wondered what he did for a living. His fingers were long and elegant. Perhaps he was a pianist or a painter. He looked up and caught her staring and a fiery flush licked her cheeks. Wondering how anyone could divorce this matinee idol, right? His mouth quirked. He drank down the remainder of the whiskey and trickled a little more into his glass. Well, she's got a better offer, it seems. Some Scottish guy. Lives in a castle. Maybe even owns it. She's been running around with him for about a year. I travel a lot for business, so I never noticed. Should have. That's what she said. That if I'd have noticed, she'd have thrown him over. But I didn't, so she wants a divorce. But she doesn't want the stain on her character, and neither does he, so here we are. Abigail thought about the invisible name on the lighter. Elsie hadn't said what to do when the small talk ran dry. She licked her lips and drank more whiskey and soda, smearing her lipstick. <laughs> that would help when she left. The more she looked like she'd been doing more than talking, the better. The clerk and the bellboy could swear to her already. She supposed a detective would be waiting outside with a camera. She wondered if Peter was paying for that too. At least it's credible that I'd be making time with you, he said. Young and pretty, good figure. My buddy Donald now, he had to go through the exact same charade for his wife and the agency sent a dame who, <laughs> he looked like the ancient mariner. <laughs> Can you imagine that? A mischievous clean came into his face. While she sipped and smoked, he kept talking, mostly about his friend, Don. They'd been in the war together in France. Don lived in Battersea and had a new nice girl now, a stenographer. He said getting divorced was like having a leg off uh, after the initial shock. It wasn't so bad. When she'd finished her drink, he said, enough about me, Agnes. We got an hour. Tell me about yourself. You can tell the truth or you can flat out lie. I don't really care but we may as well get acquainted. So they did. She told him some lies and some truths and some things which were in between. He told her all about his wife and his job and his time in the war. She didn't know how much was true and she didn't really care because his eyes were blue and the whiskey warmed her. When she stepped out of the door of the Seafree Hotel two hours later, and heard the snap of the camera, she wished powerfully that it really was Mr. Smythe, Peter, who had smeared her lipstick and messed up her hair. She looked up at the window of room 203 and saw him step back quickly, like meeting someone's eye from across the corridor of a train, someone you liked the look of, who you knew you'd never see again. And then she realised that she'd forgotten something, She'd forgotten to tell him her real name. And she smiled and stepped back inside. Thank you.